Let's solve an Oxford physics problem. So here we have a cliff and then we launch a projectile at three different angles. We launch the projectile at a speed v and first at an angle of five degrees measured from the horizontal, then at an angle of 45 degrees, finally at an angle of 85 degrees. Our first part of the problem is to simply sketch the trajectories. Now I know that the longest horizontal range is going to be for the 45 degrees and the horizontal range in this case is going to be uh, bigger, much bigger than the actual height, so it's going to look something like this, then the projectile will just end up carrying on. Why does 45 degrees have the longest range? This is actually is a classic projectile motion and I will leave the solution on the screen. Well, what will the other two angles actually look like? Well, in order to answer this, we must really be comparing the vertical height with the horizontal range. If the vertical height is a lot bigger, it's going to do something like this. If the horizontal range is a lot bigger, it's going to do something like this. Now, the horizontal range is going to be found by the initial speed v cos theta multiplied by the time. The maximum height of the projectile on the other hand is determined by v squared is equal to u squared plus 2a and then rather than s I'm going to write y for the maximum vertical distance. So final speed is going to be zero at max height meaning that u which is just v sine theta squared so this here gives me that y, the vertical height, really is proportional to sine squared. So that means that if the angle is really small, such as 5 degrees, the vertical distance will be really, really small and the horizontal distance, on the other hand, is going to be really, really large. I quite like to back up my graphical statements with an actual mathematics behind them. So for 5 degrees, our graph uh, is barely going to go up, so let's say here, and then it's going to take the same amount of distance to return to its position. So it's probably going to look, I'm going to draw this one with a dotted line, something like this. This is a sketch only anyways. And then this thing will carry on falling this way. So this is for theta is equal to 5 degrees. Now for theta is equal to 85 degrees, um, the cosine is going to be pretty close to 90, meaning that it's going to be pretty close to zero, but not quite. So what will happen on the other hand is that the vertical height is going to be much bigger. So for 85 degrees, I imagine it's going to do something like this. Okay, next one using separate axis, now sketch the absolute distance r of t is equal to the square root of x t squared plus y t squared. Hmm, so the absolute distance, if let's say we were talking about this position here, is actually this distance r across here. So if we had to sketch the displacement rt as a function of time, let's start off with theta is equal to 45 degrees. There's a little bit of a trick. Now, first of all, what's going to happen to the displacement when the projectile is really far away? Well, it's going to be really big. Now, when t is smaller, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, first of all, r of t for theta is equal to 45 degrees should be continuously increasing because this horizontal distance is going to be greater than this vertical distance. So this means that it will be increasing in this range. Now, how is it going to increase? Is it going to be linear or not? Well, the x dependence on time is linear because, well, speed is equal to uh, just x multiplied by t, but in the y direction is going to be non-linear because there's going to be acceleration in that direction. So it's not going to be linear. It will be increasing though, so I'm going to go with a curve of some sort to reach there. Next one for theta is equal to 5 degrees. 
Okay, so uh, it's going to be pretty similar. Question is, is the overall distance going to be uh, higher or not for smaller values of t? Well, the when theta is equal to 5 degrees, because x is equal to r cosine of theta, this here is going to be bigger. On the other hand, as well, this thing is going to go up and then down much quicker because it's barely going to reach its maximum height. So, well, for higher distances, this here will be quicker, but you know what? Uh, let's say that this will have a higher gradient uh, because of this. So it's definitely gonna be a curve that kind of like goes like this. I think that's right. We're gonna plot these in Wolfram Alpha uh, after we have an expression for R of T later on, just to check these. The interesting one though, is when theta is equal to 85 degrees. Now, when that happens, there's going to be a point where if we look over here, R of T will be initially sort of increasing, but then it will start decreasing. And now this vertical height is definitely bigger than, than this distance. So overall, R of T should be decreasing after some time. Afterwards, it's going to start increasing as well. So it's gonna have a pretty similar limiting behavior. It will initially increase to some value, but then it's going to dip, and then it will just kind of carry on increasing. And here are the actual plots on Wolfram Alpha. We were pretty close. For the next part of our problem, we need to obtain an expression for r as a function of t, which we know is given by the square root of xt squared plus y as a function of t squared. Well, how do those depend on time? We know that x, the horizontal range, will be given by the initial velocity cosine of the angle multiplied by time because there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction. Now, what about y of t? Well, we can say that y of t will be equal to ut, which is gonna be v sine theta t multiplied by t. This is just using the Suvat linear equations. And then um, I'm going to take away a half gt squared. Let's just plug those into here and just see what we get. So we're gonna have r of t is equal to the square root of x squared, which is gonna give me uh, v cos of theta, and both of these are squared. Multiply that by t squared. So as the first term, multiply this or add plus this squared, which is v sine theta t minus a half gt squared. That's, that's going to be a lot of algebra. Okay, well, this here will then be given by uh, v squared cos squared t squared plus first term is going to be v squared sine theta theta squared, I can see a cos and a sine already perfect, uh, that will end up simplifying. Then, uh, what do we get? Minus two, and then V sine theta t, multiply this by a half g t squared. And then we have a factor of this term here squared, which is a quarter g t g squared, t to the power of four. And now it's time to actually simplify. So what are we gonna get? We're gonna get a factor of v squared t squared. Uh, in the brackets, we're gonna get cos squared plus sine squared, which is just one, very nicely simplified. Take away those two are gonna cancel out. The t and the t squared are gonna give me a t cubed and we have left v sine theta, and the only thing we have left is a factor of g, I think. K plus a quarter g squared 
t to the power of 4. I'm pretty sure that this here is an expression for r of t. Okay, now this question is asking us to actually find a stationary point. Because this thing here is a function of time, um, what I'm going to do is just differentiate this with respect to time. So let's do this, the r by dt is going to give me... So when we differentiate this, we have to use the chain rule. So the outside function is just the square root of something. So this here will just give me minus 1 over 2, and then the square root of v squared, t squared, minus t cubed v sine theta g plus a quarter g squared t to a power of 4. Um, and then multiplied by the inside function differentiated. So I'll tell you what, just to keep these separate, I'm going to do that. And at the top, I'm going to be left with this differentiated with respect to time is going to give me 2v squared multiplied by t take away uh, 3t squared uh, v sine theta g plus... Uh, the, the 4s are going to cancel, and then we're left with g squared t to the power of 3, and this thing here has to be equal to 0. The only way this here can be 0 is if the numerator of the fraction is actually uh, 0. So what I'm going to say is we can factorize a factor of t from the numerator, Let's just write numerator across here, and then we can say t, and then we get 2v squared t, uh, take away 3tv sine theta g, uh, ooh, this, yeah, and then plus g squared t squared is equal to zero. So the only way that this can be zero if is if t is equal to zero, that's one option. That actually physically corresponds to just the moment of launch, which is perfect. The other, the other possibility is this quadratic here to be equal to zero. I'm running out of space on my whiteboard. Let's see if I can sort of solve this here. Hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, okay, so let's put this into quadratic form. I'm gonna say or uh, g squared t squared and then plus uh, plus 2vt take away. Oops, I've just spotted a little mistake. This factor of t should not be there uh, because I've factorized this out already. Just a quick check, those here are fine. So my quadratic will actually look as gt squared take away 3tv sine theta theta uh, factor of g and then plus 2v squared is equal to zero. Okay, we're trying to find a stationary point and the only way that this quadratic here will have solutions is, is if is when the discriminant is greater than zero. So we can set b squared uh, minus uh, 4ac to be greater than zero. So let me just write this, b squared minus 4ac must be greater than zero. Okay, what is b squared going to be? It's gonna be this, nine, nine v squared sine squared, and then a factor of g squared, take away 4a, which is g squared, uh, multiplied by c, which is a 2, and then a v squared. This thing has to be greater than 0. Okay, what are we going to get? We can cancel out the factor of v squared. We can cancel out the factor of g squared as well. So 9 uh, sine squared theta has to be greater than 8, sine uh, theta squared has to be greater than 8 over 9, which means that sine of theta has to be greater than the square root of 8 over 9. Uh, theta has to be greater than, let's put this into our trusty calculator, and we get that 
theta has to be greater than 70.5 degrees. So if the angle of launch is greater than 70.5 degrees, there will be a stationary point and our Oxford physics question is solved. If you're preparing for the Oxford part, you absolutely need to have a look at one of my favorite questions, which is also one of the trickiest questions that I've seen on the path. And this video is right over here. Click here, enjoy.